underrepresented youth in Western Newfoundland, especially girls and Indigenous students. Angie Payne is the Public Outreach Education Officer for the Parks Canada sites in Western Newfoundland and Labrador, including Gross Morn and Torgan Mountains National Parks, Ika Miwishpuku, Kakasuka Mealy Mountains National Park Reserve, and Portswa, Lansom Meadows, and Red Bay National Historic Sites. She has been with Parks Canada since 2000 and is very happy the night sky is now being included in the protection of natural and cultural heritage of Gross Morn National Park. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please add them to the Facebook chat and we will ask them at the end of the presentation. Dr. Barkanova, please go ahead and get us started. Sure. Thank you, Steve, so much for a wonderful introduction. Um, well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us, especially people from Bermuda. Wow, that's, that's impressive. I'm so jealous. Well, I love it here, too. I love this province, uh, the nature, the people, the beautiful night sky. Night sky is a pre precious resource, but we have plenty of it here. Uh, as you can probably see from my name and hear from my accent, I'm not from around here. I moved to Newfoundland in 2017, and I've been working with Angie for several years now. Angie, would you like to get started? Yeah, uh, thank you, Svetlana. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming, or I guess, <laughs> going to your computers tonight. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're just going to do, I'm just going to do a quick overview of, I guess, Dark Skies from a Parks Canada uh, point of view. And then uh, Dr. Barkanova is going to uh, explain all the, all the fun stuff about it. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll get started. So enjoying the Dark Sky Gross Moor National Park. Um, just gonna move ahead here. Uh, so, Parks Canada sites are ideal places for dark sky preserves um, because we're already kind of uh, controlling uh, the amount of, of infrastructure that's being that's being put in the park. So uh, we, you know, there's large, you know, swaths of land that have you know, no lighting at all. So a lot of times for national parks, it's, it's quite, uh, it's, it's quite fitting. It fits very well for the dark sky preserves. And a lot of times there's a lot of, um, you know, modifications to do in order to uh, make it you know, into the dark sky preserve. So we already have 13 places that have the designation and Grossmore National Park is, is hoping to uh, soon join that roster. The, the world's largest dark sky uh, preserve in, is, is actually here in Canada in Wood Buffalo National Park, which is the second largest national park in the world. So I guess that makes sense. So we protect more dark skies than any other agency in the world. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, so we've been working since 2016. It takes uh, quite some time to put together an application for the Royal Astronomical Society of, of Canada. Um, but it ultimately lines up very, very well with our, our own mandate, which is to protect and preserve the natural and cultural wonders of Canada's, uh, of, of Canada's heritage. So that includes the ecological and commemorative integrity. So that's, that's the natural and the cultural, but it also includes, um, it also includes nocturnal ecology. So I just put up a couple, a few uh, uh, creatures that you're probably familiar with, little brown bat, everyone thinks of those as being nocturnal, but Arctic hare is, is one that is uh, kind of a superstar here in the park. Red fox, they're all, um, pretty much every creature on earth is dependent on darkness. Those are just some of the, you know, the ones that we think of quickly. Um, but there's a lot more than just the furry creatures. So um, I guess th there's a, a science out there called scotobiology. Uh, that's the study of biology as it directly and specifically, effect uh, specifically affected by darkness. And so that's 
that's studying things like um, the how light pollution affects the circadian rhythms of of different creatures, like such as creatures in an aquatic environment, uh, migrating birds and insects, um, even impacts on humans. And we we know now that after lots of study, there have been some negative impacts on, on all of these uh, different organisms. Humans have psychological impacts, psychological impacts, cardiovascular, um, even increased cancer risk uh, with light pollution. And uh, physiology, reproductive physiology can be, can be affected and just animal behavior can also be affected. Uh, a bunch of different things, like I got a few, uh, little creatures up here. We got moths. Everyone knows moths are <laughs> affected by darkness, but a lot of people don't think of trees. Um, sometimes if a tree is growing uh, in a place that has a lot of light pollution, the leaves will actually grow too big, for instance, and it makes it susceptible to to freezing or to uh, drying out if, if all the conditions aren't just right. Flowers, the, the, the blooming times of flowers can be affected. Uh, even shellfish, um, the, it's, been, it's been studied that the, the lengths of their shells even are affected by, by the amount of light pollution. So everything is, is, um, is affected by uh, light pollution and everything has evolved to have a, you know, a, a night and a day. And we've changed a lot of that uh, in modern times with you know electric lighting and, and everything and I guess it's not until now that we're really understanding the impacts of that. Um, so for the Royal Astronomical Society to designate a an area as a dark sky preserve uh, there's two major components and that is to make sure that there's outreach uh, to educate the public uh, that the neighboring municipalities are also uh, doing things that help uh, cut down on their own light pollution and that the area itself is demonstrating good nighttime lighting practices. So uh, some of the things Gross Morn has been doing, we've been offering uh, some outreach programming as well as in-park programming. Uh, Dr. Barkanova has been very kind in coming down and, and training our staff on, on stargazing and that sort of thing. Um, so it's been a great partnership with Grenfell. Um, we've started, uh, we have uh, stargazing kits now that will be for rent next year. We were gonna put them up this year and we weren't really sure what to do with the whole COVID situation, but they're here and they're ready to go. As soon as we figure out all the, I guess the, the details on that, we'll have those for uh, for uh, rental at the park. Um, we've hosted Star Party last year, which was quite successful. Dr. Barkanova came down for that. And we've been involved with Hollywood First Nation. They've, they've um, also uh, worked with us as well. So we've got a bunch of partners working together. And uh, on our own side of things, we've been doing some of the, I guess some of the, the the elbow grease type work we've had to switch around we had basically had to do an inventory of every light in the park and see which ones were compliant with the regulations for the royal astronomical society of canada and the four main things there are the color of the light um it, if you remember nothing about color, always remember that white is the worst. The blue and the white lights, they affect um, people's uh, and not, well, creatures' rhythms the most. Uh, shielding, and that means um, lights not escaping into the sky. It's it's uh, focused downwards where it it should be, um, and not wasting energy going up into the air. Uh, illuminance is um, the I guess the brightness of the light and the scheduling. So for instance, if we have a building uh, in Grossmore, let's say it's a day use area and we don't, you know, we have, we have it on a schedule. We don't need to be lighting something at three o'clock in the morning. So we can probably have, have a schedule, a timer on the light that says, okay, we're going to, this light's automatically going to turn off at 11 o'clock at night. 
and it'll automatically turn on when it gets dark. So that's things that we had to do. We've been working on that. Uh, when we achieve, uh, we have full, you know, compliance with with the the regulations in the in the dark scar preserve guidelines, then we will be able to be declared a dark scar preserve. So we've got it in our management plan, which came out last year, that our goal is to have that by 2024. So it takes a few years to switch everything over. Um, it takes a bit of money uh, to change the lighting and, and have the staff change them all over. So it, that's, that's our goal, to have it done by 2024. Um, when we were building the application, we also had to test uh, the different sites around the park. And it was very clear very quickly that Grossmore has a lot to offer in, in terms of dark skies. So a lot of, we don't have to do a whole lot of remediation at all. Uh, you can, I don't know if the, the numbers are a little bit small here, but a 22 is a good, as as good a reading as you can get with the star, uh, with the sky quality meter. It's just this little device you go around on a clear night and you just take a measurement of the amount of darkness, uh, the luminance in, in the sky and um, 22 is the best you can get. 16 would be a, a very poor uh, score. So you'll notice there's several sites in Gross Morn that are up in the high 20s already, and that's without any remediation at all. So these, these were numbers that were taken back in 2016 before we did any remediation at all. Um, and you see on the map here, uh, it's, it's a pretty dark spot to begin with. So we don't have a whole lot to do. One of the main things was getting the communities on board. So the communities will also work towards uh, changing their lighting over, over for the next few years. Um, another thing that was important for us to do was to choose observatory sites. Um, so we went around the park and Dr. Brakanova again was very helpful with this and helping us choose which sites would be best to offer to the public for, um, for stargazing. And the ones that we chose are, are Trout River Pond. So that's on the south side of the park. Um, and you can see here in the, uh, the picture I have up here with the cardinal directions, you see there's some beautiful night skies, beautiful Milky Way. Um, right there, you can see over to the right. Um, one, the next one is Berryhead Pond. That one is uh, very easily accessible. It's wheelchair accessible and we've, uh, We've put a path in that is uh, makes it easy to get in there at night. And that's on the north side of the park. And the other one that we picked out was Greenpoint. And that was our darkest site of the, of the three that we picked out. And it, many of you might be familiar with Greenpoint Campground. So down there, and if you've ever been there uh, in, in a, on a clear night, you'll see just the stars are just millions down there. So uh, yeah, so that's, I guess, our journey towards dark sky preserve designation. Um, the last little thing on our list now is to get all those lights converted and that'll be done by 2024. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, I'll be here. <laughs> I'll be here, still here after uh, Dr. Brekanova does her uh, presentation. So uh, I'll stop sharing now. Uh, All right, I guess it's my, my turn. Right. I'll try sharing the screen. Let's see how it goes. How's that? How's that? Angie, can you see it? Yep, looks good. Excellent, thank you. All right, I'm so excited to get started. Open Space, Dark Sky Preserve at Grossmoor National Park. And Angie, you're doing such an amazing job. But just, just like you mentioned, even without converting lights and all that, Grossmoor, Grossmoor is already offering amazing stargazing opportunities. And not just Grossmoor, in many, many other places in Newfoundland. We are so lucky. As probably many of you heard, a lot of kids growing up in large city right now have never ever seen a Milky Way. Can you imagine? They've never saw it. 
but we can see it pretty much when we see a clear sky around here. Again, I am so lucky to be here. I'm a professor of physics at Grenfell, um, a campus of Memorial University on the West Coast, and we have the only professional observatory here in Newfoundland, and actually one of the largest campus-based observatories in Canada. And what makes it so great is that it's on campus, it's accessible, you can park right next to it and just walk up, which is very rare for the observatories. And that's how it looks inside. Yeah, and unfortunately all of that is closed now because of COVID, but we're adapting. And you know what? You don't need a large telescope to enjoy the night sky. All you need is a sky map and a really dark location with open horizon. By the way, if you're interested in more of our webinars like this one, um, you can go to Grenfell Observatory events page and we have a list of, uh, of webinars we're offering. Uh, the next talk I'm going to give is going to be on November 22 and I'm going to talk about subatomic physics research in Canada. Subatomic means particle nuclear and astrophysics. And here is a photograph from Trout River Pond that was a pre-COVID observation sessions, so you can see people are standing quite closely, but you can still do that. You just need to maintain physical distance. So all you need is open space, dark sky, look for open horizon, or look for minimal light pollution, and you'll need a map. So people are holding maps right here, and the October sky map, uh, the file is posted at the beginning of a chat. So if you go to chat, there is a file right there. You can, you can download and open it for your use right now, if you like. Astronomy. One of the fields of physics is the scientific study of the physical universe and objects in it. Astronomy is physics. I am a physicist, but I love astronomy. Let's learn some Greek, shall we? Greek astronomia. Anyone can read Greek? It's simple. Astronomia. It's phonetic, unlike English. Astra comes from Greek astron, which means star, and nome means distribution, which means arrangement. And for ancient Greeks, it was just that beautiful patterns on the star, on the sky, and they came with original names. Uh, we are using Latin names for constellation in physics right now. This is a physics con uh, convention. So that would be Ursa Major, large bear, and Ursa Minor, small bear. And here's Polaris, our North Star. But it doesn't have to be Latin. Moon and the seven bird hunters. Okay, I won't be I won't attempt to read that. This is a Micmac story. Here is a Ursa Major. Do you see that, that pattern right here? Big Dipper, and this is Polaris. And this is a beautiful story about seven bird hunters chasing a bear. And if you look at the story, you can find a video on YouTube. You can see how uh, the story is tracing the motion of the constellations across the sky with seasons. Again, beautiful story. Definitely look it up. It is beautiful. And it is also physics. Orion the Hunter, constellation Orion. Again, I'm going back to the original Greek stories. If you look at that, at this constellation in the night sky, you see, well, to me it looks like a butterfly, but it's supposed to be a hunter, all right. Those stars are actually not even close together, but distances can be anything at all. They just look like they are closely together. Keep that in mind the next time you look, at, you look up Orion. Another thing which I find very cool is that if you look closely and if you are in a dark, dark location like Grossmore National Park, for example, that star right here is red. This one is blue. You should be able just to see it. That means that star is hotter. I know that blue stars are hotter than red stars and that's just a law of physics. That's how it is. It is beautiful and it's also physics. 
Now you have a sky sky calendar and sky map for October 2020 right now, and it is posted in the beginning of a chat. Or you can download it from skylabs uh, skymaps.com downloads. Let's have a look. Let's say you have that map printed out and you want to go out and start sky gazing. Stargazing. What, what are you going to do first? First, you're going to turn that map upside down. So imagine you are looking from the north. Find Ursa Major, Big Dipper. Find Ursa Minor, Small Dipper. That's how you find Polaris. Find that Big Dipper right here, right here, and then trace that line. That line will show you directly to Polaris. And this is your north. This is our physical astronomical north. Not to be confused with magnetic north, which is a little bit off. That's our rotational axis for our planet. That's your starting point. Once you found your north, Turn around, turn one, uh, 180 degrees and look south. On the southern horizon, you'll see the line of ecliptic and here you will find planets. To, uh, so today, in October, end of October, you should be able to, to see Jupiter, Saturn and Mars. So that's October. That is our line of ecliptic, ecliptic Jupiter, Saturn and Mars. So that's October. Now, let's go back in time a little bit. Watch very closely. I'm going to switch from October to August. See what changed? On the northern horizon, not much actually. You still see Big Dipper and Small Dipper, and here's our Polaris. The line of ecliptic is lower. The planets are still there. But some of the zodiac constellations are no longer there, but when you see different constellations. The sovereign sky is changing month after month. And this is why every month you actually need a new card. Go to skymaps.com and download a new sky map every time. Why is the sky changing with seasons? Because Earth is traveling around the sun. In December, let's say this is December, we are right here, we live in the Northern Hemisphere. In December, when it's nighttime, you look away from the sun and you see Gemini, Cancer and Taurus. You look at this patch of the sky. During the daytime, what do you see? You see sun and the sun is blocking everything else. So also technically, during the daytime in December, that constellation Aquarius, Capricorn, Sagittarius are in your daytime sky. You won't be able to see them because the sunlight is so, so much brighter than starlight. Now, imagine eight months later, it's June. In June, during night, you're looking towards this section of the sky, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricornus. Are you going to see Gemini in June? No, you won't our sky is always changing. This is southern horizon in summer, Capricornus, Sagittarius, Scorpio, the summer triangle, we can actually still see it. I'll show you how to find it. This is the southern horizon in winter, Orion, one of my most favorite constell constellations, it's beautiful, Canis Major, big dog, Sirius, the bright sky, brightest star on our night sky, and is minor, small dog. So Orion is the heavenly hunter followed by his two dogs. This is Southern Horizon in winter. See how it's different? Completely different kind of a story. Again, you'll need a different map every month. This is our Southern Horizon right here. This is our Northern Horizon. Well, for convenience, when you're starting observer, observing, you may want to turn it upside down. Let's review. Northern Horizon, first you want to find Ursa Major, Big Dipper. It's a big constellation. It's easy to find. Then you're going to trace that line 
towards Polaris. This is our northern star. That is our exact north. That's how you find north. That's just great for navigation. So this is a small bear or some major, minor. This is our Milky Way, our galaxy. Once you found your north and you want to look at the uh, southern horizon, which is normally much more fun, just turn the map upside down or in real life turn 180 degrees. This is your uh, this is your northern horizon and this is your Polaris right here. Here is another program software. It's called Stellarium, and I posted the link at the top of the chat, so you have that as well. Uh, you'll uh, to use that. You'll need to download it on your laptop, install it. But then the advantage of that program is that you can choose any location you want, anytime you want. If you're in Bermuda, I know a couple of people here from Bermuda, Bermuda uh, at Ber in Bermuda now, I'm so envious. Uh, you can set your location in Bermuda. Keep in mind for, for different locations, the night sky is different. Any location, any time. And you can see what your sky map is going to be at that moment. So this is your north. And in Stellarium, you can uh, draw the um, drag the screen and you can change your horizon. So this is north. Let's look at the southern horizon. Just in a second. Another cool thing I want to show to you in, in Stellarium is that you don't have to stay with conventional uh, Greco-Roman terminology or Greco-Roman stories. You can switch it to whatever you want. Here I have Sami. But those are the stories I am I'm, I'm more familiar with uh, growing up. So that's Northern Europe. This is different names. Same constellations, different names. Isn't it cool? So that would be Fadna's ball and arrow. Fadna is Arcturus, who is a hunter. And this is Polaris. Polaris is called sky support, which is very, very fitting. It is our, it is uh, the point uh, of our rotational axis. This is our northern star. So this is Sami. Here is our southern horizon. Here, what you're going to see in Sagittarius, Jupiter, and Saturn. And if you look to the left, so if you look left, you would be looking towards southeast eastern horizon you will see Mars and Moon. That is today. So in Stellarium, whenever you're going to go observing, you can go and, and have, have a look. This week, whenever we have a clear sky, well, that depends where you are, in Corner Brook, and not anytime soon, unfortunately, but right now we have three planets in our night sky, which is phenomenal. We see we have Saturn, and Jupiter and Mars. Jupiter, the biggest planet in our solar system, Saturn and Mars. Mars is not large, but Mars is close right now. So again, beautiful red planet. It is a red planet. And if you look closely, you'll see it's red. So there are two sources I would recommend you to use as you go out observing uh, sky maps for every month. Or if you want to be more precise, Stellarium. And in Stellarium, you can choose your sky legend. It doesn't have to be Greek. You can choose your sky lore, and you can choose your location and your time. It is completely customizable. This is a beautiful, beautiful universe. When you just look at the night sky, you see uh, planets, and stars of different colors. But there's something else that I wish we don't actually see, but it's even more fascinating. Well, at least it is for me because that is topic of my own research, dark matter. There is a lot of dark matter in our universe. Heavy, heavy matter like us and the planets, is only 0.03% of the total mass and energy in the universe. Can you believe it? 
tiny, tiny, tiny fraction. We also have neutrinos. We have stars. Stars are made mostly of hydrogen. There's a lot of them, and yet only half percent of the total mass of energy in the universe. Free hydrogen and helium in interstellar clouds of gas and dust, dust, and then dark matter. What is it? No one knows. But there's a lot of that. And we know it exists for sure because it interacts gravitationally, it creates gravitational lensing. We even know where it is, we just don't know what it is. All we know is that it's dark because it doesn't emit any light. So that is my own topic, research topic, and that's fascinating. By the way, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2019, last year, was awarded to James Peebles and Wolf Stugai, Michael Milo, my Mayor and Didier Gil, uh, Gilos, for contributions to our understanding of evolution of the universe and Earth's place in cosmos. That's for discovery of first extra solar planet. And then for theoretical discoveries in physical cosmology, that is about dark matter. So for exoplanet orbiting solar type star and for the discovery of dark matter. We still don't know what it is, but we definitely know it's there. And here, another recent discovery, this is the first ever image of a black hole. Yes, we have an image of a black hole. You know, it's black and it's whole, nothing can escape it, not even light. So we don't actually see the black hole itself, but what we see here is the matter moving around and as it falls into the black hole, it radiates photons. So we can see a black hole indirectly. So this is at the center of galaxy M87. First ever image of a black hole. Isn't it fantastic? And Nobel Prize in Physics 2020, announced this October. That is for the discoveries on the black hole, science and dynamics. Physics is developing so quickly right now. Something new is happening every day. It's very, very exciting. I am so lucky to be a physicist right at this day and age. And if you want to learn more, I have just placed two of my most popular courses online. Foundations of Astronomy, Physics 2150, and Stellar Astronomy and Astrophysics 2151 are fully online now. So if you're a memorial student, it doesn't matter whatever you're at Grenfell or St. John's or Ottawa or Bermuda, you can take those courses, they are fully online now. So that's another exciting new recent new development. Uh, this is it, and I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. That was very interesting, and I'll be looking up for Jupiter if the corner broke sky ever clears up. Um, if you have any questions, you can please put them in the chat, and I will ask them of tonight's guests. Uh, we do have some questions from the chat. IS asks, what are neutrinos? That's an excellent question. Let me go back to my slide when I have at least something for neutrinos. Neutrinos are subatomic particles which are neutral, hence the name. They do not have electric charge, not positive uh, like protons, not uh, negative like electrons, no charge at all. That means they are moving very freely through the universe. They are very, very light, but there is a lot of them. And we are just recently learning about their properties. By the way, one of the recent uh, Nobel Prizes earned by a Canadian for Nobel Prize in Physics for Canada in 2015 was for discovery of the neutrino oscillations at the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. And that was discovered that neutrino actually have mass. Very tiny, but we still have mass. That's again, very exciting, very, very groundbreaking discovery. And that Nobel Prize went to Canada. 
Great, thank you. Uh, Noel asks a question. He asks, are the constellations which make up the zodiac easy or difficult to identify? Some of them are easy, some of them are difficult. So both. I'll give you a hint how to do that. Start with constellations you know. I always start with Ursa Major, always. Start with Big Dipper, find North Star, turn around, look to the Southern Horizon. And then some of those constellations are large and easy to find. Pisces, for example. Well, especially now, Mars is in Pisces. If you find Mars, you find um, Pisces. I call those objects anchors. Those are my anchors. Find something which is easy to find, like Pisces. And then, let's say you want to find Aries. In this case, look to the left. See that? Aries is a tiny little constellation, but once you're facing Pisces, once you find those, look to the left. Um, look to the right, you'll find Aquarius. Keep looking at your map. Use those anchors to find constellations which are harder to identify. Some of them are really, really easy. Ursa Major, well, it's not a zodiac constellation, but it's always easy to find. Another good anchor right here, Great Square of Pegasus. It really looks like a square. Look right below it to find a little circlet of Pisces, and so on. Have a map, find something you can easily find, and then work your way around. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have some more questions. Uh, we have uh, two questions, which maybe I will combine. Uh, Brock asks, can you tell us a little bit about your research? Dark matter and dark energy are hard concepts to wrap your head around. And Jonathan also asks, what is the difference between dark matter and dark energy? I'll start with a difference. And I'll go to that slide with dark matter and dark energy. Give me one sec. All right. Those are two different concepts. Dark energy is energy responsible for accelerated expansion of our universe. Our universe is expanding, but that's not the end of the story it's expanding faster and faster. Something is pushing it apart. What that something, we don't know. So we just called it energy. It's energy, it's force. This is something having, uh, making our universe to expand faster and faster. Dark matter is something actually entirely different. I know it's confusing because they're kind of called the same. Dark matter is the physical matter in our universe, which we don't see because it doesn't emit any photons. It doesn't emit any regular light. But when it comes to the rest of it, it behaves in very, very normal way. It uh, attracts other objects gravitationally. Um, you can see galaxies being bounded by in clusters by dark matter. You can see gravitational lensing. So it is matter, very physical, very real matter. Uh, it's just dark. So what is it? Well, my hypothesis is that maybe it's new types of subatomic particles, particles which do not interact electromagnetically. That means they do not emit light. So matter made of some particles, we just don't emit light. So I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. Uh, Amanda asks, is Pluto in the north or south sky? All of the planets. Now let me find the map. Here we go. All of the planets, all of them, are along the plane of ecliptic right here, and that's in the south sky. Easy, isn't it? Our, our solar system is flat as a pancake. You have sun and you have planets rotating around and around, and it's all more or less plane. Uh, G. 
it's still going to be right along this line. All of our planets are lined up. That's how physics works for uh, for so for solar for planetary systems, all of them, not just ours. Uh, thank you, Sarah. asks Do you think there are aliens in our universe? Okay, that's that's a great question. Let's think about that mathematically. I love math. There are billions and billions of stars in our galaxy, Milky Way galaxy. There are billions of billions of galaxies in our universe. Most stars have planets. A tiny fraction of those planets, I don't know how many, but some fraction are Earth-like and can support life. And maybe a tiny fraction of those Earth-like planets does have life. I don't know what that number is. Nobody knows. But if you just think about that, billions of stars in our Milky Way galaxies, galaxy, most of them have planets, billions of galaxies in our universe. So somewhere out there, chances are there is life. Great, thank you. We'll take one more question. It's actually two questions, which I will combine. Uh, Noel asks, are su uh, any suggestions for the best places in St. John's to get a good view of the night sky year round? And I'll add on Glenn's question. Is there a specific time of year that offers the most favorable conditions to viewing the night sky? And is there specific weather conditions that lend itself to the best viewing? Start with weather conditions. That's easy. Clear sky. You need a clear sky. Preferably with no moon, but if you do have moon, well, you can enjoy that too. Uh, in this case, I would advise the binoculars. The moon is the best you do with binoculars. If there is no moon, look for stars and constellations. All you need is a clear sky and dark location away from the city lights, as far away as you can. In the case of St. John's, that means some distance. And obviously open horizon. If open horizon is not possible, at least try to find a location with open southern horizon because on the southern horizon right here is where the most interesting stuff happens. That's our line of ecliptic right here and that's where you have planets. So right now that would be Jupiter, Saturn, um, on the southern horizon, Mars, east, southeast. So try to find open eastern southern horizon if you can. Uh, uh, as for the seasons, I would say there are different fascinating objects every month, every season. It's changing, but there's always something new. Um, winters are easier in a sense because it gets darker faster. So you can go stargazing at seven or eight. It is colder, so take your pick. In summers, beautiful summer nights, you'll have to wait longer until the sky will get truly dark, but then you can stay longer outside. So that's, take your pick, I love it all. And the, uh, the final part of that question, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the area because I know you're here with us in uh, Corner Brook, but they were asking if you know of a good spot year round to see, uh, see the stars in St. John's. I, anyone from St. John's who, who is more familiar with the location, I'm not, I'm sorry. Well, if anybody knows, they can actually uh, visit the Facebook page after on the Grenfell Campus Facebook page, and they can add to the comments there. And if you have any further questions, you could uh, also, I believe Angie actually is going to come in there for us. Angie, is that unmute your mic? Yes, I just, I just wanted to mention, um, I know it's not near St. John's, but uh, Terra Nova National Park is actually a, a, uh, as a dark sky preserve as well. So that's another national park. And I'm just reading here, someone says the RESC has a site at Butter Park, Butter Pot Park. So for a, a, a city the size of St. John's, like you might not have to go that far outside the city in order to see, like you might have to go maybe 20 minutes. I don't know, I don't think you'd have to go that far. I don't think Dr. Berkenova uh, can probably confirm that. Um, yeah, you might only have to go 20 minutes. You might have to go to Butter Pot 
Butterpot Park, or if you got a night, a weekend to spend away, you could try it Terra Nova, which is also a dark sky preserve already. Great, thank you. Well, that concludes tonight's presentation. Thank you to our guests, Dr. Barkanova and Ms. Payne. We also want to thank our partners during MUN Alumni Days, including Johnson Insurance, Newfoundland Power, Genoa Design International, and Memorial University Center for Innovation in Teaching and Learning. Thank you once again for joining us during MUN Alum Days. Thanks, Dave.